With a torn shoulder and detached pectoral muscle, a man once beat up the 9-3 New Orleans Saints with three sacks and two forced fumbles. He limped his New York Giants to victory, but in his mind, he was not in any pain at all. He wasn't hurt. His only truth was to annihilate his opponent by any means necessary. And he did for 13 years in the NFL. It wasn't just about the stats, about the power matched with speed and skill, not even about his sheer dominance. Lawrence Taylor had that dog in him his whole life, for better and for worse. This is the Gridiron. Lawrence Taylor was born in a middle-class environment in Williamsburg, Virginia on February 4, 1959, the first of three sons. We usually expect NFL greats to be playing football at a young age, but LT was certainly not. Instead, he was mostly getting into trouble as a kid. He was a rebellious child, and his mother recalled how he never asked permission for anything. He just did whatever he wanted. From a very young age, he was already physical and active. His mother even made him do chores like sweeping floors and carrying groceries for hours just to expend all his energy. Both of his parents worked. His mother was a school teacher and his father worked in a shipyard. LT always feared ending up in the shipyard alongside his father. He wanted a different path. LT did play some baseball as a kid, but it wasn't until he was 15 years old when he started playing football. He had a growth spurt between his junior and senior year of high school and played linebacker for the school team. LT soon realized football was going to be his ticket to college and to the life he desired. But since he started playing football so late, he wasn't highly recruited. Usually someone with such a late start does not develop the skill set to play in college. But LT's dog mentality made up for his skill gap. He ended up attending the University of North Carolina. He was recruited as a defensive lineman when he arrived at Chapel Hill in 1977. But by 1979, he switched over to linebacker. That fateful move would end up changing the game of football forever. LT quickly became a monster from this new position. His final year there in 1980, he had 16 sacks. He set numerous defensive records, and he was the ACC Player of the Year. His coaches also called him the most reckless player they'd ever seen. North Carolina assistant coach Bobby Kale said, as a freshman playing on special teams, he'd jump a good six or seven feet in the air to block a punt and then land on the back of his neck. He was reckless, just reckless. That's a theme that would continue throughout LT's playing career and his life in general. He just wanted to get the job done. He wanted to beat his opponents no matter what. He was not concerned with safety. This was football. High school hadn't built LT's playing career up too much, but college sure did. He was highly touted entering the 1981 NFL Draft. In fact, in a poll taken by NFL GMs, 26 of the 28 GMs said they would draft Lawrence Taylor first overall. Of the two who wouldn't, one of them was Bum Phillips, the brand new general manager of the New Orleans Saints, and he just so happened to have the first pick in the draft. A pick that would come back to haunt him. The Saints selected a running back, George Rogers, who had a solid career, several 1,000-yard seasons, but had to retire after seven years due to injuries. The New York Giants lucked out on LT falling into their laps with the second overall pick. 1981 was a good year for New York, and it was a fantastic year for LT. He played and started in all 16 games and tallied nine and a half sacks on the season. He tacked on a fumble recovery and an interception too. As a rookie, he was immediately dominating the league. LT not only won Defensive Rookie of the Year, he also won Defensive Player of the Year that season. The rookie was that good. It was the LT way, by whatever means necessary, get the job done. His dog mentality prepared him well for the league, but that same reckless abandon also led to some serious problems. With his new NFL money, LT began using hard drugs like cocaine and crack his rookie season and throughout his career he'd use it, sometimes even showing up to practice or games hung over or still under the influence of drugs and alcohol. With LT, you got it all. And what was most bizarre, he seemed to thrive with all of these things that should have hurt his game. But in LT's mind, he was a machine, and he had to win at all cost, even when it was going against his own coaches. 
In a game against the Cardinals in his rookie season, there was a play where LT rushed the passer and got a sack. The problem was he was supposed to drop into coverage. Bill Parcells chewed him out, telling him he didn't do what he was supposed to, and that was not in the playbook. To which LT responded, well, we better put it in on Monday because that plays a dandy. The next year was a shortened season due to a player strike. Only nine games, and LT still put up insane numbers. Seven and a half sacks in a season that was essentially half its normal length. And the big man even had an interception that he took 97 yards to the house. And he was defensive player of the year again. LT's dominance from the linebacker position continued. Offenses started to change their strategies just for him. Like in the divisional round of the playoffs in his rookie year, the 49ers coach Bill Walsh assigned his best blocker on the team, guard John Ayers, to specifically block LT. It worked out in that playoff game for the Niners. But as LT gained experience in the league, he created his own game plans. His mind was set on beating his man, physically and mentally, on every play. LT even had his reckless off-field methods to get an advantage over the competition. He often sent call girls to the hotels of opposing players to party and tire them out the night before the game. When he looked into the drowsy eyes of his opponents the next day, he had already won the mental battle. And he wasn't just getting sacks and tackles, he was doing it violently. There's no stat that tells you how much a tackle from LT hurts. But if you watch the replays, you'll get a good idea. Perhaps there was no better example than the play you can't avoid mentioning when you talk about Lawrence Taylor. In 1985, they played Washington on Monday night, and when LT came barreling towards quarterback Joe Theismann and sacked him, he broke his leg, which literally ended Theismann's NFL career. You may think that game in 1985 would be the most memorable moment of LT's career, but he wasn't done yet. The following season, 1986, LT did three things. He won Defensive Player of the Year, again. That set a record for winning that award three times, which was only later tied by J.J. Watt and Aaron Donald. He also led his team to a Super Bowl victory that season. Fantastic! But the most rare achievement of the season was that Lawrence Taylor, a defensive player, actually won League MVP. In the NFL, that does not happen. The only other defensive player to win MVP was Alan Page in 1971. Lawrence Taylor did it in 1986. Those years make a huge difference. We all know the NFL is an offensive-driven league. Offensive players constantly get the benefit of the doubt and the benefit of the flag. The mainstream fans want to see high scores and lots of passing yards, so the NFL obliges. This is why offensive players always win MVP, and now it's really a quarterback award. In 1971, the year Alan Page won MVP, the league was seeing very low total offensive yards per game. The average passing yards per game was 155.7. In the 80s, the offensive numbers spiked. Total passing yards were over 200 per game on average, and rushing yards were in the 120s and somehow a defensive player still took MVP. With the offense favoring tendencies of the NFL, Lawrence Taylor will almost certainly be the last defensive player to ever win MVP. Now, it's also important to note that this whole time, the man is living like a junkie. In public for the first time on television, he tells all about his life as a strung out junkie spending thousands of dollars a day every day on crack and women. His first wife even had to pick him up from a crack house at one point. In 1988, he failed a second drug test, so the NFL suspended him for 30 days. A third failed drug test would end his career. So he did stop until his retirement. LT won another Super Bowl in the 1990 season and played until 1993 before retiring leaving behind an outstanding football legacy. However, his substance abuse problem only worsened. In fact, LT admitted his excitement about finally being able to use cocaine again upon his retirement. Soon after, he was arrested three times for attempted drug possession. He associated mainly with drug users, and his home had white sheets over its windows like a crack house. But in 1998, he finally got on the path to being clean. Lawrence Taylor described the LT persona he had during his playing days as just another adrenaline junkie. 
In 2003, he stated, LT died a long time ago, and I don't miss him at all. All that's left is Lawrence Taylor. And he now has a new obsession, one that his agent taught him back in 1985 while he was skipping rehab. It's golf. Taylor plays five to six times a week if he isn't on the road. When he does go on the road, he brings his clubs anyway and just hopes that he could still find some time to play. He's even played with four-time major champion Raymond Floyd. And once when playing at the Pro-Am, he and Phil Mickelson shot at the same time and he knocked Phil's ball from going into the hole. Taylor admitted to that being his fault. Maybe a part of that reckless LT will always be there. Love him, hate him, or fear him, Lawrence Taylor commanded the respect of his peers. Even with all the noise, he was a first ballot Hall of Famer. He forever changed how the game of football is played. He set the gold standard for the modern day dog mentality. If he is not the defensive goat, then who could it possibly be?